Hello, it's uh, time to grab your Bibles, and we're going to look at some scripture today. Today, I want to talk about, um, does the new covenant replace the old covenant? This is something I've been taught since I was a, a little kid, that the new covenant replaced the old covenant. Um, as I get ready to talk a little bit here and introduce what I'm going to be saying, you might want to start turning your Bible, because you're going to have your Bible. I'm not going to put scripture up on the uh, screen. Uh, I'm, I don't do that. I, it's a Bible study, so grab your Bible. I'll give you time. We're going to look at the, your Bible. It's better that way. You can make notes in your Bible if you want. Um, um, I think that the scripture up on the screen is just kind of lazy, and it's important that you're actually in the Word, because I might be using the Dave local version, in other words, what I think a scripture means or says, and I can I make mistakes. We all do. But yeah, well, that scripture, it says this, and then you go back and read it, and you miss some words out of it. Um, anyhow, um, so the scriptures we're going to be into today is really uh, mainly Jeremiah 31 um, and Ezekiel 36. Um, and just would like you to uh, you know, be ready to be there, to go there. Anyhow, let's get started. Jeremiah 31, the new, well, the new covenant. I was told from a kid that the new covenant replaced the old covenant. In fact, I told people that. Um, to tell you a little bit about me and my background, um, I grew up in church. Then I had my knucklehead years, you know, and I got clean in AAA uh, for a number of years. I probably got like 30 years clean. And I mean, yay, celebrate. That's great. But no, I mean, it's normal. Most people don't use and have addictions like I did, especially like I did. Anyhow, um, we had a child 24 years ago. My wife said, it's time to get back into church. I want my daughter to grow up in church. I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. She says, you don't understand. I mean, with a mommy and a daddy both going. I was hard-headed. But we started going in church and bounced around to a couple churches. Ended up in this large church, um, you know, thousands of people in the church. And I got very much involved in it. Um, a lot of people thought I worked there. Some people, the associate pastor described me as the busiest man in the church. Um, because I was involved in like lots of different ministries. In fact, I even got called in to meet with some pastors, like asked me if I was trying to cover up some sin in my life, like trying to overcompensate by serving. I'm like, no, I just realized what Yeshua did for me and I want to do help do that with other people. So anyhow, um, I was very much involved in men's Bible studies. And there was a guy that came in who's messianic and teaching us that you have to obey the law. And I'm like, no, no, no. Christ fulfilled the law. It's over. It's over. The old covenant was got done away with. The new covenant replaced it. So that's what I want to talk about today. Was I telling people the truth then, or was I mistaken? Was I flat out wrong? And the answer is, cut to the chase, I was dead wrong. The whole idea that the old covenant replaces a new covenant is a lie straight from the pit of hell. But let's look at that. Don't just take my word from that. So we're going to go to um, and look at, okay, you're going to find it in Hebrews 8. We're not going there. There's no need to go there because it, that's not where it came from. See, Paul, who wrote about it in Hebrews, and of course we assume Paul wrote Hebrews, who knows for sure. Um, but anyhow, in Hebrews, there was a disciple, a teacher actually, that would have been teaching it, that was writing. The teachers expected their disciples, if they were to mention a passage of scripture, they expect them to go back there, to go to the original scripture and study that and study everything around it so that they know exactly what they're saying. Like an example of this would be when Yeshua was up on a cross and he's dying there for our sins. Um, and he says, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? Um, was he like being forsaken by God because God couldn't go to hell? And you've heard that said before, I'm sure. At least I have. Um, no, he was, actually wasn't. He was saying, um, this, you find that phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me in the Psalm 22? So he's telling everybody, okay, guys, get out your Bibles, turn to Psalm 22. Here's what's happening today. I am being crucified as David told you I would a thousand years ago. Don't be confused about what's happening. That's what he was doing. So and rather than going to Hebrews 8, let's go to Jeremiah 31, where we first see the new covenant. Now, I'm always wondering, you know, if the new covenant replaced the old covenant, I know the Bible talks about the old covenant. Which old covenant was it? I don't know. 
I'd like to tell you another story before we get started. I like stories sometimes, but I really love the Word of God, and we're going to spend most of our time in the Word of God. And this is just a thought that the church has, a, um, and it's a misconception, and I'm going to make fun of it. I hope God doesn't strike me, strike me with lightning here. But we, 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 we bought a house on an island down here, and it's close to the beach, and we love it. And so we started looking at churches, and we went to the big church, you know, the one that's got the good band, the one that's got all the lights and, like, the whole production of everything, the ones that generally don't like those churches. But we went, and I try, I, I, I'm not going to be divisive in a church. I've done that. It's not helpful. Scripture tells you not to. Um, I just sometimes don't understand how people believe the things they believe in the church when uh, Scripture tells you something completely different. But anyhow, so this pastor was teaching on the covenants. The first one he did that I heard was he talked on the marriage covenant. That was cool. I had no problems with it. I'm like, all right, this isn't that bad. We come back and he talks about the new covenant. Starts off by saying, oh, the old covenant, it was so ugly. All those animals dying and the blood. There was blood everywhere. It's a good thing God came up with something new. So I wonder, what was God thinking in heaven during this? You're going to get to hear my like really bad Jewish accent, but I could see God now. Actually, I can. I'm making this up. Um, Oy vey, I tell you, look. Look at my temple. They're never going to get that blood out of the floor. And all those poor animals, my animals that I created, they're dying everywhere. What are we going to do now? What am I supposed to do? I've got to come up with something new. I got it. A new covenant. Yeah, right. Like God made a mistake? Really? I don't think so. Right, let's go to Jeremiah 31. Um, 31, 31. And I'm going to take a lot of time explaining this one. Behold, stop there, behold, grab onto this, latch onto it, understand it. This is very important. This is like major exclamation points before we even start. you got to get this. That's what it's saying. Behold, the days. Psalm 90, and it's also in the New Testament, but Psalm 90 tells us a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So this is saying the days are coming. In other words, a couple, it's going to be a couple thousand years for this covenant to come into effect. Um, and you'll see this throughout Scripture, the day of the Lord, thousand years. In that day, thousand years. Um, this was something that was taught by um, a little prophet who was teaching little, uh, a prophet that was teaching little prophets how to become big prophets by the name of Elijah. This is something that they taught. Um, so it's going to take a couple thousand years for this to happen once it comes into effect. But anyhow, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judea. Israel, north, Judea, south. They were a divided kingdom. Notice it doesn't say for the Gentiles, for the Americans, for the Baptists, for the Catholics, for the uh, Presbyterians, for the Pentecostals. It doesn't say that. It says for Israel and for Judea. Hmm, let that one soak in. When you start thinking that the, you start thinking that this new covenant replaced the old covenant, you don't have to do any more of the Hebrew stuff, but the covenant is actually for Israel and Judea and not for the church. Now, so this covenant is not in accordance with the covenant that I had made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband of them. In other words, there was nothing wrong with that covenant. It's just they broke it. They didn't follow the law. They didn't follow Torah. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Hmm. So now it's the house of Israel. In other words, Israel and Judea, Israel, north, Judea, south, are no longer separated. They're together again. That doesn't happen until the millennial kingdom after tribulation when Yeshua is reigning and everybody's brought back into the land. That's when this covenant goes into effect. I know, I know. It's contrary to everything you've been told, but just stay with me. But you're not going to have Israel and Judea reunited again until that day happens. But let's keep reading. Here's what the covenant is. 
This is what God says it is, not me. I will put my law, my Torah. In other words, same law, but it's a new location because he's going to put it in their minds and in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So in other words, instead of it being written on stone tablets, on parchment, it's going to be in your mind and in your heart. Where do we see this? Hmm. Let's go back. Let's turn. If Turn with me a couple of chapters ahead to the book of Ezekiel, and we're going to go to chapter 36. And I want you to start in 24. Uh, I'll give you a minute to get there. And it's going to start off by saying that we're, I'm going to take you from among the nations, gather you out of the countries, and bring you into your own land. Okay, this is where God, you know, in 70 AD, people were dispersed all over the world. Also, the Assyrians dispersed um, Israel all over the world. Okay, and God saying that I will bring you back to your own land. And this, you can find it throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, throughout prophecy, that God's going to bring everybody back into the land of Israel, because that's where Yeshua is going to be. And we even know in the book of Revelation that, you know, when we get raptured, we will be with Yeshua forevermore. If he's going to be in Israel, um, as this, um, the glory of God is in the temple in the midst of Jerusalem, we're going to be there too. Um, and so that's actually a really cool prophecy in Ezekiel 47, the stranger. Um, we're going to run across the phrase. No, maybe we don't. I'll get there when I get there. So let's go back to, let's start into Ezekiel 36, starting in chapter 24. You have to understand, my mind just spins and I start thinking, should I go here? Should I go there? And as I'm talking, I'm making decisions about where I'm going to go and what I'm going to say. And um it can be interesting in my head sometimes. Luckily, you're not there. Um, chapter uh, Verse 24 in Ezekiel 36. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. So what he's talking about here is in the millennial kingdom when Christ is reigning. Then I will spring, sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from your filth, filthiness and from your idols. Um, we can see this elsewhere that the river that comes out of the side of the temple that makes the Dead Sea clean. It's also in the book of Revelation. And you have the tree of life on either side of it. The purpose of that river is to cleanse you and to remove sin. Um, and that is Jesus on the great day of that feast. In other words, that's um, the last day of Tabernacles, the water festival, when Jesus said fountains of living water will flow from me. That's what he's talking about. I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. This is his new, the new commandment where he's going to put his Torah into your heart. I will take from your heart, uh, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Hmm. Okay, a lot of people say, well, no, 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 that's when we accept Christ and the Holy Spirit comes there, comes to us. Really? Is that, and so when the, in other words, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, is that when we, um, is that when God causes us to walk in my statutes and keep, and you will keep my judgments and do them? In other words, follow Torah? Yeah, right. Um, and then it says, and, and is that where we will dwell in the land that I gave your fathers? No, this is millennial kingdom stuff. All right, let's go over to Ezekiel 37, and we're going to see something similar, starting in chapter 21. Um, and understand that we were just seeing um, the dry valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37. We're not going to go there, but that's where Ezekiel sees Israel with like the, the dead bones and they all come together and become alive again. That's Israel coming back to life. We saw that in 1948. And then we have, and then we're at a part talking about one kingdom, one God, um, or one kingdom, one king. This is about Yeshua becoming king. Um, but anyhow, let's pick up in verse 21. Um, then say to them, thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel. Okay, children of Israel. Hmm. All right, that's a phrase that is that we get when um, the, at the Exodus, when they're coming out of Egypt. 
2 million people came out of Egypt. How do you get 2 million people from uh, 12 people that were there for 370 years? How do you get 2 million? You don't. You can't. It's impossible. And they were in there for 370 years. Anyhow, how you get it is that there's a lot of people that came out that weren't Jews. The children of Israel are Jews and Gentiles alike. All right. Joshua and Caleb, the two uh, spies that got it right, Jew and Gentile. All right. So and there's actually a pretty cool, and if you want to track this out, maybe one day I'll do it in a video, the stranger that has tied himself to the Lord. That's the Gentiles that have chosen to live by God's ways. And there's a cool promise to that, that Gentile in, um, or the stranger in Ezekiel 47, that they will receive their inheritance in the land with whichever tribe that they choose to live with as a native born. And of course, that's the Dave local version. Hey, let me keep going here. Um, surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations where they had gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. So this would be, uh, both in 722 BC, when um, Israel or Ephraim, the northern kingdom, was scattered all over the world, and God actually is in uh, Zechariah, God says He planted them that they're going to grow and they're going to teach others about Torah. Uh, interesting that He planted them there. The reason for Him scattering them. Anyhow, and also it's 70 AD when you have the great dispersion and Israel was destroyed. And maybe we'll talk about that one another day. But that he scattered them all over the world. So he's bringing them back. This is at the end of tribulation. And I will make them one nation in the land. Okay. Um, the, the, remember that. Hold on to that. I will make them one nation in the land. One king shall be their king over them, Yeshua. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms. Um, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things. That's eating piggies or eating the food you're not supposed to eat. Nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from their dwelling places in which they have sinned. And, they, and, and I will cleanse them. Again, that is the river that's, that cleanses sin. Um, then they shall be my people and I will be their God. Notice that they're following God's ways. They're following Torah. David, my servant, which is a representation of Yeshua, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. We're following the law. We're following Torah. Okay. Um, then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob. We keep seeing that. My servant. And your fathers dwell... There they uh, shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall, shall um, be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. This is the new covenant. And it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I, sh and I will establish and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. All right. Let's go back to... Um, Jeremiah 31, and we'll get into this again here. Um, so this covenant, not verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was a husband to them. No, nothing wrong with the covenant, they broke it. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel again. Now it's just the house of Israel. So this is after the millennial kingdom when everybody's back in the land, where there is no northern and southern. Everybody's back in the land together with one king. After those days, the Lord says, I will put my law. And that word there, if you want to look it up, you know, Blue Letter Bible, whatever you use for your concordance, that law is, that word is Torah. I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I shall be their God and they shall be my people. So this is what makes me laugh. So God's saying that I will put my Torah in their mind and in their heart. It's no longer on rock. You know, God gave us that, is taking away that heart of rock and giving us a heart of flesh. It's no longer on rock like the Ten Commandments. It's no longer on parchments. It's in our mind and it's in our head, but it's Torah. 
So how can this new covenant replace the old covenant? Yes, it is different, and it's the location. But the church has twisted this to make it sound like we no longer have to, the Torah has been done, it's been fulfilled, it's over with. The Torah is done away with, but God's putting the Torah in our heart and our minds, and we're supposed to follow it. That's the new covenant, folks. That's the new covenant. But let's keep reading. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For if I forgive their inequity, for I will forgive their inequity and their sin, I will remember no more. Okay, think about this. This pastor who was teaching about the new covenant, if the, if the new covenant is in effect, think about this with me. If the new covenant is in effect, then no more are you going to have to teach your neighbors about me or your brother. You don't have to say, tell them to know the Lord. You don't have to go out and evangelize because everybody's going to know them, know the Lord. When is it that everybody's going to know the Lord? That's in the millennial kingdom, where the only people in there know the Lord. Because in, in the millennial kingdom, there is no pagan idolatry. There is no sin. All of that stuff's vanquished. It's gone. It is completely and totally gone. So if you have a pastor, a pe preacher, a teacher, teaching you about the new covenant, they don't understand it because it's not an effect. All right. Remember I said about the days are coming, and I, I've got a, I didn't write down the scripture I want to get to. Um, I want to get into Matthew and look at the Last Supper. Um, anyhow, actually, I don't even need to go there. But um, anyhow, that the days are coming. What do you need to have a covenant start? What is required for a covenant? You need a sacrifice throughout the Old Testament. In order for there to be a covenant, you need to have a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. That was Yeshua. That was Jesus Christ. And at the Last Supper, which was a Passover Seder. And it's interesting that the Jews like would do all these things with the Passover Seder and have no idea, no idea why they're doing them. And it was understood, though, that when Yeshua would come, that Yeshua, their, or the Mashiach, their Savior, the Messiah, when he came, he would explain all the elements to the Passover Seder. That's what Jesus did. That's what Yeshua did before hand, before the Passover, because he wasn't going to be there. <clears throat> so what did he say? One of the things that he said, and you go to Matthew 26. I'll give you a little bit of time to get there. Yeah, delayed a little bit to get there. Matthew 26. And we're going to start in verse 26. Matthew 26, 26. This is the Passover. This is the Passover Seder. This is the Last Supper. Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take, eat this. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of my new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say this to you. I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Yeshua as he's about to be crucified, said this is the blood of the new covenant. The blood that he is going to shed when he was crucified, 
buried and, and arose for our sins. His blood is the blood that was shed for many for the remissions of sins. It's going to take a couple thousand years from the time of the covenant, at least two. That'd be getting close to that point for the covenant to fully come into effect. Um, we actually see this in Hebrews 8, too. Uh, I didn't think I was going to go there, but let's go there real quick. Hebrews 8. And looking at verse 12 down. And, and most of Hebrews 8 is identical to, to um, uh, Jeremiah 31, so it's redundant. But we want to look at 12 and 13 in Hebrews 8. For I will be merciful to the unrighteous and their sins and lawless deeds, lawlessness, I will remember no more. If you're there when the millennial kingdom, you're good. And he says, a new, and in, the, in that he says, a new covenant. He has, has made, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The new covenant, where everything's on stone and on parchment, does pass away, but it's the same law. The Torah doesn't change. The Torah goes from stone, parchment, to your heart and your mind, okay? And it's becoming obsolete and growing old. And he, the writer of Hebrews did not say it was obsolete. It's going to take 2,000 years for that to happen. That's the millennial kingdom. I'm telling you, it's a choice. Do you want to be greatest in the kingdom or least in the kingdom? Do you want to follow God's laws or not? That's a choice you have. God gave you that choice, but choices have consequences. I'll ask you this. And you see in the new covenant, part of the new covenant is everybody's going to be following God's laws. Because that's what he's going to put in your mind and in your heart. Why would you get rid of them here if in the millennial kingdom you're still doing them? Something to think about. Uh, thank you for listening. I thank you for watching today. We will come back, and I'm going to be doing other videos. Um, if you don't know this, I do a um, – I've been following End Times Prophecy for a number of years. That started in 2007-ish. I understood that I had to um, – understand the Hebrew, because God told us the end from the beginning, so I had to understand the Hebrew from things. I mean, I don't speak Hebrew or anything, but I had to go back and understand the Old Testament, so that's what I started doing, and I started realizing that I had I had things so backwards. Um, and now I lead a Messianic Bible study um, based on the teachings from John 1415.org, Creekside Messianic, check it out. Um, <coughs> awesome teachings amazing teachings, unlike any other teachings that I've run across. I know everybody's got their teacher, everybody's got their pastor. You don't want anybody else's, you know, people say, you got to listen to this guy. They send me videos. I don't do it, you know, but I'm telling you, this guy's worth checking out. Um, anyhow, I, I, I'm going to, I just feel led. I'm going to keep doing this. I wanted to write a church, a book about, you know, what's wrong with the church. And I'm having trouble getting it off the ground. I mean, I'm just not a writer. So, but I can talk, as you notice, I can talk. So I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing videos, knocking out little pieces by little pieces. But you were lied to about the new covenant. If you had a pastor tell you that the new covenant replaced the old covenant, so you don't have to do anything there, that the new covenant's in effect now, we know from scripture that that's not true. And there's a lot of other things you've been lied to about too. Is it the pastor's fault? No, that's he was lied to. We've been deceived. Rome changed everything and it's not good. Um, but anyhow, and we're going back thousands of years. And when I say Rome, yes, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church. I'm talking about the church, the institute, not individuals. Um, God didn't give us a bunch of little churches, a bunch of different denominations. God gave us his word that we're supposed to understand. That's what he gave us. Um, with Peter, 
you know, upon this rock, I will build my church. That word church is ecclesia. It didn't make any sense. It wasn't the synagogue. It was a gathering of everybody in the city. It's a gathering of all the believers. So that's who God gave his word to. God bless you. I look forward to you joining and getting me again. Share this out. If you like this, share it. Discuss it with people. Um, thank you. God bless you and have a great day.